I've been connecting to the outdoors through my taste buds and teaching people about that since I was in high school. So I grew up in the town of Weston, and when I was a sophomore in high school, I took a mini course that the biology department offered called Edible Botany. We went around the high school grounds and learned about two dozen species of edible plants, and then we had this communal meal from the plants that we had learned about. And that was the spark that ignited this lifelong passion I have. So that summer of 1972, I went to the local library, appropriate, here we are in a library, and I took out every book I could find in the topic, which I think was like six books that that library had. And I read them from cover to cover, and I taught myself over 70 more species. And by senior year of high school, I was teaching that same class that I'd taken as a sophomore. So that was before I started my career with the fish and game department. So anyway, but there's been a nice synergy while I was working because my job required me to, and some of you know Maria Van Dusen, she actually was my boss at the Riverways program for a number of years. And then she retired and that became the Division of Ecological Restoration and I was still there until last June when I retired. But while I was working, I was working on rivers all over the state, especially in Central and Western Mass. So I was frequently out there before, after my official work is done, I'd be out there with my foraging basket, just collecting whatever happened to be in season. Because for me, foraging enriches all the time I spend outdoors. So whether it's a vacant lot in downtown Boston near where my office was, or along the seacoast, or in the mountains, or in the suburbs, there's edible wild plants all over the place. So it's really fun to know this stuff. Even if you're not actively hunting and gathering, just to see this stuff as you're walking along the trail, it's like having old friends greet, greet you as you're walking along. So that's why I do it, and it's really fun to share uh, my uh, love and enthusiasm for the subject with you. So um, now some of you will remember that I spoke to the Marblehead Conservancy several years ago in this very uh, venue, and, um, and uh, I, I know for some of you it, that a refresher course in the same subject will not be lost at all. You'll benefit from hearing the same information again, just to have it sink in a little bit more. But I did change the show in reflection of uh, the point that was raised about me earlier that as I have retired, uh, not only do I keep connecting to the outdoors through my taste buds and just gathering all the edible stuff, uh, but I'm also aspiring to be a Johnny Appleseed of sorts for native edible species, and I'm learning how to collect the seeds of all these wild plants and, and, uh, and nuts, the wild plants, and then propagate them and then get them out in the landscape. And when I get impatient, I just buy plants and then plant them in the landscape, of course, with the permission of the owners. That, so I'm working out arrangements with land trusts and, um, and cities and towns and uh, state and federal agencies as I'm you know, walking different properties and identifying what seems to be appropriate plants to go in which locations and stuff. So uh, eventually I'll have lots of plants to put out in the landscape and I'll have lots of places to plant them. So that's um, the theme for the talk tonight. So the theme is, as you may recall last time, I was talking about all the things you can nibble on in Marblehead. So this is the weeds and invasive species as well as the natives. Tonight's talk is focusing almost entirely on natives. You see the asterisk there. I couldn't resist talking about one non-native species that's so abundant in Marblehead, I couldn't leave it out of my talk. It's not something you'd ever want to plant though. But anyway, you'll, you'll know the plant when I get to it. But anyway, but the, the, the purpose of tonight's talk is to talk about stuff that you might think there might be a place in your own yard for it. So, all right, you can cut the lights now and we'll uh, carry on from there. So everybody can see the slideshows okay? You don't really have to see me. All right, so um, here's how most people approach the subject of native plants. Is there anybody, could I see a show of hands, is there anybody in this room who has not heard of Doug Tallamy? Okay, quite a lot of you. All right, so let me put it this way. Doug Tallamy, it's, as Al Gore is to raising the public consciousness about global warming, that's what Doug Tallamy is to raising the public consciousness about the importance of native species. And he is a very sought after speaker. We've been able to lure him to New England a number of times. I've heard him several times. He's extremely eloquent in explaining the value of going native in your landscaping um, for to support uh, our ecology, particularly our birds that we cherish so much, because he has observed through many years of observation that the major thing that the 
mama and papa birds are feeding their little baby in the nest are caterpillars. And those caterpillars need a native species to live on because they don't recognize the non-native species as food. They haven't evolved for them. Because it turns out plants have chemical defenses and caterpillars have evolved to find ways around those defenses so they can live on those plants. And those are the ones the birds seek out and feed their young. And so if you bring a non-native species from China, there are no local caterpillars that know how to eat it. And so in places where the where that are bereft of native plants, they're bereft of caterpillars, and they're bereft of the birds for that reason. So it's a very eloquent argument. And um, and that is enough to get a lot of people to say, okay, we we understand we're going to go native in our landscaping. So here's a project that's been at it for some time. So if you ever find yourself in Great Barrington in the Berkshires, and um, and you're downtown Great Barrington and you have a half an hour to kill, find the Brooks Drug Store, which is right on Route 7 on the, uh, the east side of the street, park there, and you hop out of your car and you're going to see a kiosk for the Housatonic River Walk. And just follow the trail and in about a minute, all the noise and hustle and bustle of Great Barrington is gone and you just have the beautiful river and all these beautiful native species growing along the bank of this river that used to be your classic, you know, the river that was neglected with all the rubble and all the, excuse the expression, I'm going to talk about this later, Japanese knotweed that was piled up everywhere and they took it on and they've been able to, you know, push it back and establish these native plants growing along the river. It's a wonderful inspirational place. I've led foraging walks there. It's a great place. So there's projects like that which are happening, which are very inspiring. And then the state governments have been trying to get on the bandwagon and promote it too. So they've putting out good uh, outreach pieces to explain these values of these uh, different uh, native species and, and so on. So, um, all right, so now I have to tell you uh, an interesting conversation I had with the presenter of a talk on native species. This was at the Ecological Landscape Alliance conference several years ago. Her name is Kate Venturini and she works in Rhode Island and her job is to work with the coastal landowners along Narragansett Bay and to get them to pull up their lawns and their parking lots and stuff like that and where they can plant native species to help absorb the runoff from the roads and the and the lawns and stuff before it gets near against the bay to help keep that bay cleaner a very laudable objective so she's giving her talk and this is part of her talk a really great and i'm sure most of you that have ever dealt with plants have seen lists like this where you have the name of the plant on the left side and then you have all these columns to the right that tell you various attributes about the plant gets tall gets short likes wet likes Dry, like shade, like sun, all of that. Is that better? Okay, fine. You can still see the slides okay? All right, great. So, um, so I went up to Kate afterwards and I said, Kate, where's your edibility column? And she said, oh, we don't tell people that. And I said, why not? And she said, we don't want people to eat these plants. We want them to leave the plants just for the wildlife. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You've got blueberry on your list. Are you telling people to plant blueberries and then never go out and eat any blueberries? Oh, no, we wouldn't do that. Well, you might as well tell them what else is edible. So now in Rhode Island, they do. So the major outreach peach, they have the, edib the edibility comp because the, the point that I'm making is that the you can eat it too card is a really powerful card. And I think it's enough to, well, that it's not going to get everybody to rip out their lawn and put in native species. But my argument is it will convince an additional group that aren't sold in just the pure ecological argument. And so uh, that's, that's my shtick. If, if just you know knowing it's helping the birds is enough for you, fine. But if the you can eat it too thing is enough to get you to actually do it, then great. So that's what the talk is. So tonight's talk is the you can eat it too plants. All right. OK, so this just tells uh, uh, you know, why uh, I'm doing this. I don't have to go into that now. As I explained before, when I'm out in the landscape, you know, I'm, I'm not asking a plant for its passport or its pedigree. If it's yummy, I'm going to harvest it and eat it. And, uh, and in our landscape, we have a lot of yummy weeds and invasive species. And although ecologically they're not good, in fact, they might even be bad, from a forager's perspective, they offer guilt-free foraging opportunity because you can't pick too much of them, provided you're not spreading the plants around in the process, but that is easily avoidable. So. Um, so tonight's show is about plants that you'd want to deliberately add to your landscape, and that's not weeds or invasive species. So that's why they're not on my show. But I just want to say that you know I'm 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 happy to forage on them, and I, I encourage you all to do that too. 
Okay, so here is my one exception to the everything on my show is native, and this I could almost call the official wild plant of Marblehead because there's so much of it, and this is indeed the Japanese knotweed. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you have a ton of it, and uh, anyway, it is one of my favorite edible plants, and I gather a lot of it every year, and it's really yummy, and so um, it's not in season yet, but it will be in about uh, two and a half to three weeks. And so this is the first stage to get it. When the shoots first come up, uh, then it's, uh, you just snap it off at ground level and you can just steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to get it is what I call the wild rhubarb stage, when it's a little bit taller, like about two feet tall. And so I'll find the fattest sprouts I can and cut it off at ground level and lop off the top cluster leaves. I'll have a length of stalk about that long. So you see right there is what I harvest and I just chop that bit off. Now you want to peel the very outer layer of the stalk off because it's stringy. There's nothing poisonous about it, but if you cook with the unpeeled, the, it might get caught in your teeth. Mm -hmm. So just peel that off. But the knotweed stalks are hollow, so you don't want to peel too deeply or all you have left is the hole. You just want to get that very outer layer off. And then you end up with a crisp green tube that looks like that. You can uh, eat it right on the spot. It's tart and juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you could chop it up and use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So that's what I've done here. So that's my raw material for baking. So here is my strawberry knotweed pie that I make every year. And virtually everybody I feed this to prefer it over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's really, really yummy. And that recipe is in my foraging book. And I did bring some of those books tonight. So if you want to get one, uh, I can uh, sell you one later. I'll talk about that later. But anyway. So now some of you might be looking at this pie and say, I don't know, I'm intimidated by pie crusts and that lattice work top. I don't know if I can pull that off. Okay, I'm going to show you a way to use the knotweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. Is you could just take those little hollowed out parts and fill them with like a salmon mousse or a flavored cream cheese. And you have a little tart, little edible container and it's a delightful little appetizer. All right, so that's enough about the non-native species. Now the rest of this is natives. Now, um, this isn't really important for this crowd because I'm talking mainly to homeowners, but when I'm talking, just so you know, when I'm operating in a little bit larger landscapes, like going to conservation land under control of conservation commissions and stuff, there's a couple things I'm paying attention to. And one is um, that uh, um, there are some places in New England, I don't know of any place like this in Marblehead, because Marblehead has this long, long history of human disturbance of the ground. But if in New England, we still have a few isolated areas where you have pristine, undisturbed plant communities. And the high priests of botany have said to me, you know, we don't want anybody to go in there and think that they know better than Mother Nature what plants ought to be there and start introducing things that aren't there naturally. And so I'm totally sensitive to that. It turns out, though, as I said, that those types of lands are less than 10% of all the lands we have. Most of them are lands that have a history of farming or forestry or something where the land was quite altered and the plant community there is not intact from times primeval. And so it is possible to tinker with it to help uh, enhance its biodiversity and its edibility. So, and then um, there are some lands where no picking of any kind is allowed, like Audubon sanctuaries. And, um, Although uh, I think that having that policy on all or open space would be unduly rigid, I do certainly respect having that, uh, that rule in place for some areas because what they are is they're like the terrestrial equivalent of marine pre protected areas, in, in case you don't know. So these are in areas where you take a certain area of the ocean and you say, okay, let's keep the intense fishing out of this area so the fish can breed unmolested in this spot and then the, they can swim beyond the boundaries of that and then we can catch them. And, and it's actually a great technique for overall sustainability of the ocean. And so terrestrially, I think it's sensible to have some areas set aside so there's sanctuaries for whatever plants are growing there. And then the, those plants can uh, get beyond by birds pooping out the seeds or whatever. And then as the plants spread from that protected sanctuary, then there's opportunities for us to interact with them by nibbling on them. So and then, um, uh, so those are the major two points I want to make there. All right. And then it's how do you know if a plant is native? This is the official document called the Yellow Book that you can look stuff up in. This is a little dense. You have to be sort of you know comfortable with botanical Latin and stuff like that to wade through something like this. But um, a wonderful website, uh, and I don't 
take technology out with me in the woods. You know, I don't have foraging apps or things like that. You know, I leave all that behind. You know, you know, so I do use a computer a lot, but just not out in the woods. But anyway, I recommend the Go Botany website, which is New England Wildflower Society's website. I use it a lot. It's got wonderful information there. And it's it, because Arthur Haynes, who uh, helped produce this knows a lot about foraging. It often says which plants are edible on there too, so it's great. All right, so that's uh, the background. Now let's get into some specific plants. Okay, let's start with this one. Okay, anybody know what species this is? Okay, well I heard a couple of people say, because knowing what species it is is actually kind of important. This is one of the most frequent mistakes that novice foragers make in Eastern Mass. A couple weeks from now you're going to start to be walking the woods and see ferns like that. And what I've heard many occasions, uh, people be out there and say, oh look, fiddleheads. Gee, that looks just like what I've seen for sale in the stores. It must be the same thing. And so they'll pick it and they'll bring it home and they'll cook it up and it'll taste horrible. And they'll say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvested the wrong species of fern. So I leave, there are dozens of species that grow around here. I only know of two species that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity. And that's this one. This is the ostrich fern. So I'm going to teach you the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. First thing is habitat. So this habitat does not exist in Marblehead. Okay? Okay, but you could create a little micro version of it by bringing in some appropriate silty alluvial floodplain soil and get a little patch of the ostrich ferns established in a shady, damp part of your yard. Uh, ostrich ferns are readily available in the trade, so you should have no trouble finding them and planting them. And I've seen them used in a lot of home landscaping, and they're very attractive plants, and they do very well, and they're also edible. So, so but that's the typical habitat you find them in the wild. And then when they mature, they turn into that very distinctive vase-shaped clump. Uh, when they're small, the fiddlehead stage, the edible stage, look for the vase-shaped clump too. And then on the ostrich fern, you have these fertile fronds, the spore-bearing fronds, and they have a little U-shaped groove running down the center, as do the fiddleheads themselves. So let me go back there. All right. So you see right in there is a U-shaped groove that runs in the inside of the stem and the entire length of the stem. And also, this bit here, which are called scales or bracts, this stuff is papery and it comes right off with your fingers. It's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. So if you remember all five of those things, then you know for sure it's the ostrich fern. Uh, even so, you have to boil this fern to make it safe to eat because there is an enzyme in a raw fiddlehead called thiaminase, thiaminase which actually destroys vitamin B1 in your body. So you can develop a vitamin B1 deficiency if you ate undercooked fiddleheads. So cook them well and they're safe to eat. And when I'm gathering these in the wild, by the way, I encourage everybody that's foraging from the wild to, to use a lot of restraint, especially when native species are involved, because you wouldn't want to pick so much from a plant that you could upset the ecological balance in any way. So I'm picking one or maybe two of the cold up parts per clump, that's it. Because if I picked every single one and then a couple emerged from the base and somebody went back in the woods a week or two later and they picked all those, you could kill that rhizome and kill that individual plant. So just one or two per clump. And in the wild, I often see the ostrich fern in patches of hundreds of clumps and then one or two per clump, you're still getting plenty. Okay. All right, so uh, if you've ever bought ostrich ferns at the store and cooked them up and thought, yeah, this, this, what's the big deal about these? Uh, you might try this method, which I would call the sweet corn method. It's basically to minimize as much as possible the time between the gathering the ostrich ferns and the eating them. And this is uh, illustrated to me very dramatically a couple years ago when I went on Beth Basler is the person in the photo here, and she's a naturalist out in Western Mass, and she took us to the fiddlehead patch, and she brought the cook stove with her to the fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were really good that way. OK, so here's a, a plant that uh, we've heard a lot about in the news. This is milkweed. This is the common milkweed, although the monarch butterflies use other milkweed species too. This is the one edible species of milkweed. It also is the most abundant species of milkweed. And uh, you can get it to grow in your yard, but it does, to be honest, have a rather assertive uh, uh, pattern. You know, it uh, will spread, it will pop up in places where you didn't originally establish it. So if you're comfortable with that, fine, this would be a great plant. If, if you're, you'll be mad at me for suggesting it, remember I told you that the plant does that. Yes, ma'am. I, I thought that the, um, the monarchs, the, the habitat for the monarchs was so endangered that we shouldn't have been having that. I'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. 
No, I think I think you can relax about it, at least to here in New England. But I'll get into more details about that in a second. All right, so I call this a procrastinating forager's dream food because there's at least four edible stages uh, of this plant. And if you mess up and miss a stage, you could just wait a while till the next edible stage shows up. So this is the third edible stage. There's a whole chapter on this plant in my book if you want more details about this. This is a third edible stage. The uh, Milkweed flower buds that are in a tight green cluster. Mm -hmm. By the way, I am boiling all the milkweed parts I'm eating for seven minutes, and that makes them completely safe to eat. And you see in this next slide here, whoops, that um, these milkweed buds have been boiled for seven minutes, and look how you know it, they're completely unaffected by that. If anything, they're even prettier than they were before, when you pick them off the plant. And here's a milkweed egg puff. This recipe is in my book. It's a great way to use the milkweed buds. Okay, and milkweed pods are edible when they're nice and firm to the touch when they're about an inch long and you boil them for seven minutes and the texture and the flavor is very similar to green beans. Okay, yes, so I've got the monarch caterpillar there to remind us, yes, this is the plant, the monarchs, one of the species of milkweed the monarchs rely upon. And yes, there have been very uh, uh, worrying stories about the decline in the monarch populations, although the most recent news is very encouraging that a lot have wintered over. Uh, so. Uh, that's encouraging. But anyway, I have been assured by ecologists that it's not the foragers of New England that are hurting the species. What the major thing that's, that's uh, causing the problem is that, uh, and you may know that the monarchs that we see are in, here in New England are not the ones that started in Mexico. So the ones in Mexico fly like 500 miles north and they lay their eggs in the milkweed and then the caterpillars and the pupate and then the adults from there fly another 500 miles north and then they lay their eggs and pupate and then uh, and then those monarch butterflies are the ones that get to New England and Southern Calendar. So it's like uh, Canada, it's like two or three generations after the Mexico ones. So anyway, problem is that in that first couple trips, they're flying through the Mississippi Flyway in the Midwest, but there's a lot of use of the Roundup Ready crops like corn and soybeans, where they're planting the genetically modified stuff that can take the herbicide. And so they, they douse the field with herbicide and the, the corn and soybeans survive, but the milkweed doesn't. So that's what happens is that the monarchs aren't finding. But so there have been some efforts to try and reverse that trend, and they're also very encouraging. But in the meantime, what I do just as a karmic payback to the monarchs and just to help uh, get this plant out there is uh, in the fall when I see a patch with a really healthy population of the pods that are split open and the little parachute showing with the seeds attached, I'll gather some and then I'm propagating them at home into new plants to plant out in the landscape. And also I'll save some of the seeds just in my card if I'm traveling around and I see an old field that doesn't have any milkweeds, I'll just release some of the parachutes and help start a new colony. <laughs> All right, so here's a plant that grows in Marblehead. Uh, steer Swamp is one place I've seen it. So this is sassafras, a plant that's exceedingly easy to recognize in when the leaves are open because the leaves have three different shapes, no thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs on the same tree, only tree that does that. And uh, it has two edible parts. The edible root is actually the bark on the outside of the root uh, that has a very unmistakable root beer flavor and aroma. And in my book, I've got a recipe for sassafras uh, uh, candy, which uses little pieces of the root bark embedded in the candy. So it's like the root beer barrels used to buy at the penny candy store, only even better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you can make sassafras tea from the roots. Okay, now here's the potential downside. It, and you know, I'll have you make the decision for yourselves. But about 50 years ago, the, several studies came out where they fed a huge amount of something called saffron, which is an essential oil that is in sassafras root bark. They fed a huge amount of it to rats and some of those rats got cancer. And they said, okay, that's it. Sassafras is off the market. The Food and Drug Administration bans saffron that's in sassafras. So sassafras can show up if the saffron has been taken out. But if you're finding in the wild, the saffron is going to be in there. And so, um, so it is something that you know gives me pause when I think about it. But um, uh, all those studies showed is that a huge amount of saffron will cause cancer in rats. I'm not aware of any study, and I've looked hard for this, that shows that humans getting cancer from sassafras. But even so, if you said, even if there's a possibility there could be any link, you don't want to eat it, I totally support you in that. In fact, I support you wherever you want to draw the line because, you know, eating wild plants involves some degree of risk, you know, just knowing you've got the right thing. You know, might be looking at a plant and say, well, I think that's a plant Russ talked about in his talk, but I'm not sure it's the same thing. And so you chicken out, you don't eat it. I think that's pretty sensible to do that. So uh, I hope, though, to build some confidence in you tonight that you feel, yeah, I know that plant, I can try that plant. But anyway, so that's the root bark.
But then the young leaves of sassafras are also edible. So if you've ever heard of filet powder, which they use like in Creole cooking and gumbos and stuff, that's made from dried powdered sassafras leaves. So you can make your own. You harvest the leaves and they're about an inch long, dry them and pulverize them and put it into the little salt and pepper type shaker. And then just add it to your soup or your stew, whatever, just before you serve it. And it will flavor and thicken it. And it doesn't have any of the, the saffron in there. Okay, and sassafras is one of our most underappreciated fall foliage plants. So if the edibility alone isn't enough for you to plant it in your yard, you know, this kind of, you know, fall look might do it for you. Okay, bayberry, this plant will grow uh, along the coastline because it can do what pea family plants can, is it can uh, make its own nitrogen fertilizer. So it can grow in poor soil. So I see this plant inland as well as along the coast in places where the soil is poor, like old gravel pits and stuff like that. And you can use the bayberry leaves like bay leaves. And if you're using the fresh leaves and you put them in your soup or stew, whatever, they'll soften right up and you don't have to worry about fishing them out because if they end up in somebody's uh, soup bowl, they could just slurp it right up with everything else. Okay, so here is uh, the basswood. We also have the little leaf linden, the tilia cordata, so whether it's the introduced tilia uh, street tree or the native tilia americana basswood, it's edible the exact same way. The young leaves are edible and the flowers you make a tea from and the tea has a very nice flavor. It is also uh, has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and to your mental state at the same time. So it's, uh, it's very highly regarded medicinal tea in Europe for that reason. Okay, here's Juneberry. This one grows in Steer Swamp too. And it'll be looking like this in just a week or two because this is one of our earliest trees to bloom even before the crab apples are blooming. And that's a good time to spot it when it's blooming because you can see this white color at a distance. Because when the fruit is ripe, the fruit is uh, kind of a purpley color and purple's a hard color to see at a distance. But Juneberry's, <clears throat> it's a wonderfully uh, delicious fruit to stuff your face right by the tree. Uh, the flavor uh, tastes like a cross between cherries and almonds because it's actually related to cherries and almonds. They're all related species in the rose family. So uh, Juneberries are great. There's a chapter in Juneberries in my book. I've got a few recipes there, like a recipe for Juneberry muffins where you can use the fresh fruit, the dry fruit, or the frozen fruit, and it comes out well uh, any of those ways. And that, that's used a lot as a, a street tree. So landscapers use it a lot too. So, some of the best places I've found to pick Juneberries are actually in parks. They're not, you know, way out in the wilderness somewhere. They're just, you know, in the, the landscaping that the park people chose because it's an early bloomer and the birds like the fruit and people do too. And the typical Juneberry tree, by the way, is 12 feet tall. And I've never seen anybody get on a tall ladder and pick every fruit from the top branches of the tree. No, they're picking the fruit that they can reach and the birds in the upper branches and they're picking out. So you're all just enjoying the wonderful fruit and there's plenty to share is my point. Okay, and strudel is a fun way that I use the Juneberry. All right, so wild strawberry. Now, um, wild strawberries are small. There's no getting around that, but they sure are yummy. And, um, and it suddenly occurred to me over the past year as I began to morph into this Johnny Appleseed type character that wild strawberries could be growing in anybody's lawn. You know, as long as you don't have, you know, your your uh, chem lawn type, you know, sterile monoculture that I think Michael Pollan says that a lawn like that is nature's version of totalitarian rule. <laughs> so, but anyway, but uh, wild strawberries do fine, you know, mine being mowed and then you have this little surprise when you're out there in your lawn. So this is a plant that I'm trying to propagate. The New England Wildflower Society sells them. So if you want to try growing a few wild strawberry plants in a, in a, a lawn or type habitat in your yard, that, that would be fun thing to have. Okay, so here is the flowering raspberry. So this is our most pretty flower in the Rubus genus. And, um, and those uh, blossoms are almost two inches across. And, uh, and you see the, those gorgeous large maple-like le maple leaves. And this plant has virtually no thorns. So that's another good thing about it. And um, you can eat the fruit on this plant. It's not the most delicious, luscious fruit in the Rubus genus I've ever had, but it is edible. And sometimes you can find a lot of them. So if you have a relatively cool microclimate, uh, cool but sunny, uh, this might be a good choice for you. Then there's black raspberry, which can tolerate a much more wider. So there's a lot of this already in this part of Essex County. I saw a bunch of it today in Danvers. And, um, and I don't need to tell you what to do with the black raspberry fruit. I'm sure you know what to do. But uh, I'll tell you that the time to spot black raspberry plants when you're out in the landscape is now. 
or any time during the off season from like October through March because that's what they look like. They have that very distinctive purpley color to the canes and you could be out walking your dog or you know just out enjoying nature in the winter, even cross country skiing when we had snow and, uh, and see that and remember where that spot is and then go back and check it in late June, early July for the fruit. Okay, there's a black huckleberry. So this, I've seen a lot of this like up in Cape Ann and Dogtown and other places like that. So it definitely can tolerate really rocky, sunny areas. So if that's what you have, this could be a good landscape choice. A lot of people go out picking blueberries and are picking the huckleberries instead. There's absolutely no harm to that. They're actually related species. The huckleberry is a little waterier and cedar than a blueberry, but other than that, it's fine. Then there's the blue huckleberry, which I tend to see in a little bit more shady, wet areas. It's a taller plant. The nice thing about the blue huckleberry is the fruit is ripe relatively late. So you could be away traveling around and come back at the end of the summer and say, oh, I missed the blueberries, but you haven't missed the blue huckleberries because I found these after Labor Day. They're still around. All right, so this photo I took in Marblehead, and uh, this is the common elderberry. And it is a relatively common plant, I'm happy to say. But I'm just going to get onto a soapbox a little bit as I talk about this plant and get into a subject that I didn't have to talk about. The first 30 years I was teaching foraging, this wasn't relevant. But over the last 10 years or so, foraging has gotten kind of hot and trendy. And a lot of, I hear a lot of hyperventilating by foodies and chefs and stuff about wild plants. And this is one of the species that I hear them salivating after, elder flower. So not the elderberries, but it's the elderflower to make drinks like, here's a couple examples. So this drink is made in New Zealand where the elderberry plants aren't native, so I can't really complain about that. And then this is St. Germain liqueur that allegedly has some elderflower in it. And I imagine that they're gathering the plants sustainably, otherwise they put themselves right out of business. But anyway, um, so let me tell you a quick story. A specialty produce store in the Boston area contacted me several years ago and they said, tell us where the elderberry plants are so we can pick the flowers and make this syrup that we could sell at our store. I wouldn't tell them. I told them the kind of habitat the plants like to grow in, but I didn't want to tell them about a specific spot because I was too afraid they'd just go hammer it. So here is a scenario. I don't know if this has actually happened, but I think it's plausible. Take some chef who's really jazzed about elderflower and wants to put it on the menu, says to somebody in the restaurant, hey, go out there, pick me 10 pounds of elderflower. So you have this poor schnook running around, running around, and finally finds a bush like this with all the flowers on there. And he looks at that bush and he says, you know, if I pick every flower off this bush, I can fill this order. And I don't have time to run around and find other plants. I gotta get back to the restaurant. So there go all the flowers. This means no flowers are left for any pollinators. No fruit is gonna form in that plant because you have to leave the flowers on the plant to get the fruit. So that's the kind of impacts I see when I hear about the commodification and the monetization of wild plants. So, uh, you know, I, uh, and, and when this first came to my attention, I thought, holy crap, what am I doing? Am I actually hurting these plants by giving these talks? And I thought about this a lot, and I eventually said, well, uh, I'm going to keep doing it because, you know, I approach this subject from a very conservation-minded way. And if I abdicate the field, then it's going to be left to the people that just don't have the scruples and the responsibility to do it right. So anyway, so, um, so what I said, uh, let, let me just finish telling you the story. Okay, so uh, uh, an important aspect of native species is they often have important roles in the ecosystem and ants will, and animals will rely upon them for food and some other important portion of their life cycle. So I just want to illustrate that with this particular species. So this critter right here, the elderberry borer beetle, spends most of its life associated with the elderberry plants. So the adults lay the eggs on the plants, the little larvae bore into the plants and they live inside the stems of the elder plants and they're not hurting the plants at all. They've co-evolved for millennia, they do fine. And then, the, the, and then these cool looking adults come out and they made and they start the cycle all over again. So now if the foodies went and stripped all the flowers off the plants, they're not killing the beetle directly, but if we began to inhibit the plant's ability to reproduce in the wild and we started to lose them in the wild, then it would be harming this beetle too. So that's the kind of adverse effects I see of the really large scale commercial scale foraging. I'm not worried about the hobby level foraging that people that uh, take my classes and go my walks do, you know, where they're gathering for themselves and have a couple friends over. That, that level is fine. So anyway, um, so um, 
before I get to this, so I'll just finish the story about what I, the, my conversation with this restaurant. You know, I said to them, you know, we have some delicious edible weeds and invasive species out there. And if you're going to commercialize wild plants, can I point you in that direction? Like there's a plant which you probably know, a marblehead, was in my show a few years ago, called the black locust, which has this delicious flower. Black locust is not considered native to Massachusetts, a complete guilt-free foraging opportunity. You can pick all the flowers you want completely relax about it. Delicious uh, flowers make really excellent fritters. No, this store said we only want elderflower. And so I said, okay, well, under those circumstances, may I suggest you get a farmer to grow it for you? Because a lot of farmers will have edges where they have these meadows, you know, where they can't plant traditional row crops, but they could put in a row of elderberry plants. And if they grew them up and then all those flowers showed up on restaurant menus, at least they're not harming the wild populations. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the advice I gave. Okay, so if the flowers stay on the plant, you'll eventually get berries like this around the end of August. Now, elderberries aren't good to eat straight off the plant because you can get a stomach ache if you eat a lot of them that way, but if you dry them first or cook them first, then they're perfectly fine. Okay, so sweet fern is one of the plants the colonists made tea from when they were boycotting the British tea during the Revolutionary War era. It's related to bayberry, and it also has a nitrogen fixing ability, so it can also grow in poor soil. So if you've got a place in your yard, a sunny spot where it's just really challenging and you can't get anything to grow, this plant should do fine. It is available in the trade. Sweet uh, goldenrod, there, there are 100 species of goldenrod. There is one edible one, and that's this one, the sweet goldenrod. The colonists knew it was edible. They learned it from the Native Americans. And the whole plant tastes like licorice. So it's really fun. You can make a licorice-flavored tea from it. Okay, and then here is one of our native wild mints, the Monarda fistulosa. And um, this one, just like, uh, you know, and I hear this uh, from time to time when I'm talking to gardeners, oh, mint, you don't want to plant mint. It's invasive. It's going to invade your tomato patch. Don't plant it. And yes, mints tend to do that, okay? But I wouldn't use the word invasive that way. I save the word invasive for the ecologically disruptive plants. I will just say that a plant has an assertive growing habit. It's, you know, will spread on you, okay? Without putting that pejorative term on it, which I like to save in an ecological context only, all right? So, this is a native species, so it can't be invasive. Just by that, native means not, can't be invasive. In, in my, the way that I define things. That said, it will spread, but, you know, there are, you know, in, in you know, the Marblehead Conservancy might have a situation where you're battling some non-native species and you've cleared them out and you want to plant a native species that's going to get in there and hold its ground and spread and fill that area that you remove the invasives from. This might be a good choice for that because it does what mints do. And that's, so in that context, it, it's a good choice. Now, uh, mints vary in flavor uh, into two basic categories. This is sweet flavor and the savory flavor. So the sweet flavors are like spearmints and peppermints that you use for mint julep, mint ice cream, mint tea, uh, mint candy, stuff like that. And then the savory ones are used for pizza, sausage making, and sauces and stuff like that. So I find this to be more savory flavor, like sage or thyme uh, is how I would use this plant. All right. So here is spice bush, and this one uh, also grows in Marblehead. And this would be a great choice if you have a damp, shaded lot where you have hardwood trees. This uh, plant does very well in shade, especially where there's uh, a perennial or intermittent stream nearby. And um, although this isn't a major, as major an issue in Marblehead as it is for some places, the deer don't like this plant. And so for places that, you know, that you're worried about planting anything because of the deer, this would be a good choice. Now, this plant does come in male and female, so if you want the pretty berries on your plant, you should plant more than one, and that will enhance your chances of getting a female. So uh, this is another plant the colonists made tea from, from the twigs. They'd steep the twigs in hot water. Uh, the berries are the part that I go after, and I dry them, and I pulverize them, and it's a savory spice like black pepper or Szechuan peppercorns. But, these berries are very important to migrating waterfowl because they're high in lipids and so the birds will eat them to fuel their southward migration. So it's important to leave lots of berries on the plant so the birds get what they need. Okay, here's another reason you might want to plant a spice bush is you might get a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. These also live on sassafras, by the way. And mostly you won't see them because they roll, they curl the leaf around them and they hide inside that curled leaf. But if you pull the leaf apart, you can see them inside. But in their later, what's called an instar, which are the different life stages of a caterpillar, this is near the end and they produce these fake eyes to, to imitate looking like a snake, to try and intimidate the birds from eating them. All right, 
So wintergreen is a plant that I see a lot in New England and our, in our acidic soil. So you see the pine needles there. I often see it associated with pine trees. Very nice ground cover. The whole plant has that wintergreen flavor. Little berries are not very sweet, but they do have that wintergreen flavor. But when I want to make wintergreen tea, I tend to make it from the black or yellow birch. And I just uh, take the twigs. And you can do this any time of year. So even now, before the leaves are out, if you know if you have a black or yellow birch, you just take the twigs and peel them and put the peeled twigs and the peelings in a jar, fill it up with water. You just let it sit around for an hour or two, and you will get a nice, strong flavored wintergreen tea that way. All right, May apple. This plant I don't really run into in the wild in New England, but if you go further south like Pennsylvania, it can be quite, quite common. But it does grow here, and a lot of people will use it, once again, as, an, a, 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 as a ground cover. This plant gets to be about a foot tall. It's a really cool looking plant. It has these leaves which are like uh, about 10 inch diameter umbrella shaped. And where there are two leaves coming out together, and they come together in a little crotch, this little white flower forms like that. And uh, that's why it's called May apple, because the plants bloom in May. And then the fruit is ripe in August. And I found out from a botanist in the Wing and Wildflower Society, he would have let these fruits ripen a little bit more, a little bit darker yellow, and let them wrinkle up a little bit. Uh, that's when a, a May apple is truly ripe. And the flavor is very unusual. It's very tropical. It's almost like a guava. So they're really fun. Just make sure you're eating the fully ripe fruit. But that would be an excellent landscape choice. Okay, black cherries, uh, this is an opportunistic species. So when an area is cleared for farming or by woodcutting, whatever, this one native species finds its way in often. Uh, uh, it's popular with uh, uh, the caterpillars, so the birds like it. And the birds also, whoops, and the birds also eat the uh, cherries, and, um, and we can too. The flavor of black, black cherry varies a lot from tree to tree. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent, not very yummy at all. And then other times, like I found a, a tree uh, in Gloucester that was uh, really sweet and very yummy. Uh, and I really enjoyed just stuffing my face right by the tree. There, there is one um, you know, admitted downside. These fruit are small. Okay, so. Each fruit will approach but not quite get to a half an inch in diameter, and the pits inside them aren't that much smaller than conventional cherry pits. So I wouldn't recommend using black cherries for any recipe that required pitting each individual fruit, because that would be exceedingly tiresome. So I'll just like run them through a food mill after I've simmered them for a while to soften them up and separate the pulp from the uh, pits that way. All right, what is this plant? Really? I thought you'd get it right away, you get being coastal folks and all. Anyway, yes, the beach plum. Okay, what Plum Island was named after, in case you haven't figured that out. So anyway, uh, this is one of my favorite edible wild plants, and, um, and it can be really yummy. So I'm going to teach you what might be the most valuable piece of information for some of you tonight. And that is, if you want to find your own wild beach plums, don't be trying to find them in August or September when the fruit is ripe. Look for them when the plants are blooming in May because they stand out much more conspicuously in the landscape that way. So when you see bushes that look like this that have these masses of yellowy white flowers, remember where those spots are. And then, you know, end of August, Labor Day, you know, into early September, that's what you want to look for. So once again, the fruit is purple. It's a really hard color to see at a distance. And you more or less have to be within 20 feet of a beach plum bush to see if there's fruit on there or not. Now, last year was a really good beach plum year. The bushes were very well endowed with fruit, which is wonderful. Uh, may we have the same year this year? I, I can't predict at this point. Did you have a question? Okay, let me put it this way. Maybe, maybe, maybe this, this very uh, uh, sweeping generalization will help you. For New England, and I'm not talking about the world over, okay, but at least for New England, I don't know of any fruit that looks like a beach plum that is poisonous. That, that, okay, yeah, there's, there, there's poisonous fruit out there, but uh, there's nothing I know of that tastes good and is poisonous. Okay, so you could take a fruit and put it in your mouth and give it a little taste and spit it out right away. So you're not ingesting it, you just put it in your mouth to get the flavor and spit it out right away. And even if it was poisonous, the worst thing that happened is that you'd feel nauseous for a little while and that's probably because you scared yourself to death more than anything. <laughs> okay, so 
I, I mean, I didn't learn that way. I didn't learn by just popping stuff in my mouth as I walk down the trail and see what happens. You know, all the trial and error work has been done by Native Americans and lots of people over millennia, so we can benefit from that accumulated knowledge. But it's not an inherently hazardous thing to do to give a brief taste, unless you're talking about like stinging nettle or poison ivy or something that the contact dermatitis would cause you a problem. But almost all the poisonous plants, you have to actually swallow them to make them make you sick. Okay, and beach plums do not have to grow near the ocean. I mean, a marblehead, that's not an issue, but you know, they will grow, you know, far, far away from the ocean. What they really need is sun and well-drained soil. So not a good choice for a really ledgy spot, but if you've got a spot that's fairly well-drained, they should do okay. Okay, so there's no poisonous species of viburnum. They don't all taste good, but there's some that taste good, like this uh, wild raisin and the nanny berry. Uh, uh, tastes good. And uh, wild grapes, although I've also heard people say, oh, those grapevines are so invasive. Once again, this is a native species that's just occupying the niche that it naturally was evolved to occupy. It's just doing its thing. And if uh, you don't like it, you don't like it. I can understand that. But I, I just hate to hear the word invasive used to describe this plant because it's, it's, you know, doing what it does. So anyway, um, but this is the one I grew up calling the conquer grape when I was a kid, the large grapes that are ripe. You often smell this vine before you see it, and it's a great thing to find in uh, early to mid-September. And you just find your vine and stuff your face by the vine. You can also make delicious things like this uh, uh, fox grape cheesecake with it. Then um, sometimes in more urban areas, I tend to see this species instead, and this is the riverside grape which has a smaller grape, which isn't as yummy raw. It's uh, ripe later in the season, and they're kind of musky flavored. You can still use them for jam and jelly. But the fox grape, I think, is a nicer flavor. But this has very delicate leaves, smooth leaves that are uh, green on the underside as opposed to being white or coppery like the fox grape. And so some people that make the stuffed grape leaf recipes like this species better for that reason. But you can use any variety of grape to make the stuffed grape leaf recipes. Okay, so here is sumac, and uh, I hope most of you know better, but sometimes I'll hear, oh yeah, sumac, that must be poison sumac. Well, any red-berried sumac is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. Poison sumac has drooping clusters of greenish-white berries, like poison ivy berries. So if it's a red-berried sumac, it's an edible one. So this is the staghorn sumac. This is a chapter on this in my book. And uh, the main thing you eat on it is you make a drink from the berries, and it's very easy. You just pick them off the plants and smush them in a bucket of water. The water should be lukewarm or colder, not hot, not boiling, because that would make the drink too bitter. And uh, just uh, uh, knead the berry clusters in the water for a few minutes, and the flavor will get off the berries and into the liquid, and the water will turn this pink or pinkish orange color. And then just fish the berries out and strain the liquid through a cheesecloth, paper towel, clean t-shirt, whatever you have. And then you have your sumac gave, which you can drink hot or cold, sweetened or unsweetened. And the entire time it takes from gathering the fruit off the plant to drinking the drink is only about a half an hour. Okay, and sumac is another beautiful fall foliage plant. All right, so we have edible nuts in uh, Massachusetts that could grow in Marblehead. So here is the hazelnut. We have two different species of hazelnut. By the way, oh, sorry. They are doing this right now. They're blooming right now. And uh, if you have very sharp eyes, you can see this. I saw this today in Danvers. So here is the male flower called a catkin that's hanging down. And then the female flower is this teeny little thing, about an eighth of an inch in diameter. But it's this beautiful magenta, almost like a ruby color to it. And it's wind pollinated. So that little female is hoping the male pollen is going to you know, fly up into it, or other catkins from other plants. And then uh, months later, you get the hazelnut. And so it looks like a little head of cabbage with a developing nut in there. And when they begin to turn brown is when I'm picking them off the plant. I'm not waiting till these hit the ground. Because if you wait until they hit the ground, you will never find them. The squirrels and chipmunks will get all of them before you do. So I have a date on my calendar mark when I gather hazelnuts. That date is September 8th. And that's the date I found where the nuts are almost ripe, but still on the tree. And then I'll gather them and just spread them out in a newspaper in my garage and leave them alone for a couple weeks. And then the husk will turn brown and pull apart from the nuts. And then uh, you can eat them. And they're, they have the same flavor as store-bought hazelnuts. And they're smaller. So you might say, why bother? I'll just go buy hazelnuts. That's fine. But it is fun to gather your own hazelnuts. And this is a plant that you could plant. And actually, I brought two species of plants that are... that 
are at the plantable stage, and this is one of them, and shagbark hickory is the other one. So if you want to try planting a hazelnut plant, come up to me afterwards and I will give you a nut to plant in your yard, and I'll explain how to do it. Okay, so that's the common hazelnut. Then there, we also have the beaked hazelnut where the developing nut is inside here, and you have this strange thing sticking out like a bird beak. These both grow in Massachusetts. Then here is the, um, the white oak, which has the leaves like this. Basically, all oak trees produce acorns, and all acorns are edible. The only question is how long do you process them to get the tannins out? And usually, it's the acorns from the soft oak species that are lower in tannic acid than the hard oak species, which are the leaves that have the pointy lobes to them. Uh, but I know people that, you know, the harvest the red oak, you know, the, the pointy lobe species, and they do fine with it. So whatever acorn you have, you can try processing it to make the acorn flower. All right, so here's the shagbark hickory. So this is my number one favorite uh, edible species. Uh, this one happens to be native, but I'm including everything, native, non-native, weedy, whatever. This is my number one favorite, my number one favorite to find, to gather, to process, to eat. Uh, I have to have a favorite, and this is it. So anyway, so the tree looks like this. I saw some of these. If you ever go to Endicott Park in Danvers and you park right by the parking lot, there's several trees that look just like this growing in the parking lot. But there's a lot of these trees in Essex County. You're very fortunate. Not so much in Marblehead, but if you get into the more farmier areas of the county, that's where you're going to see them. And often you see the, the trees right by the roadside. And if you're at, like bicycling in late September, early October, make sure you've got your panniers on your bicycle and you can just stuff those full of the nuts that just pile up right along the roadside as you're riding around. It's really fun. Okay, so that's what the husk looks like. And I have some in the back if you want to see. And then that's the nut inside. There's the penny for scale. And so baskets like this, uh, my car is pretty much full of them from like uh, mid-September through the end of October. I'm out gathering thousands of these because I like them so much. And so there's what the husks look like as they fall off the tree. So that's what they look like on the tree. You don't have to pick them off the tree. Uh, just wait till they fall down. Don't wait too long because the squirrels will get them. And then... Uh, and so here is my maple hickory nut pie. So this is what I made for dessert at Easter at our house, and everyone loved it. And the guests called me afterwards because I'd sent them home with the leftovers, and they just thought it was very generous. But I said, look, I have plenty of hickory nuts. I can crank these out any time I want. So this is the New England version of pecan pie, and virtually everybody I serve it to prefer it over pecan pie. And the recipe for this is in my book. Requires a, a, about a cup and three quarters of shag bark hickory nuts, which would take you about an hour of shelling them to process them to get that many. All right, so this is what I made the dessert that I contributed to the snacks outside. This is what I made it from, the black walnut. So that's what it looks like when the nuts are on the tree. You don't have to pick them off the tree. You wait till they hit the ground and they look like old green tennis balls. <laughs> and so um, uh, in early October, I'll be driving around the countryside and I'll see a yard with a bunch of these piled up in there and I'll go knock on the door and I'll say, I see you've got some black walnuts. Would you mind if I harvested some? And the typical response I get from the owner is, wait a minute, let me get my wheelbarrow and fill it up for you <laughs> because these are rather messy. You know, they'll stain your fingers brown and they smell. And so people are kind of eager to get them off their property. So I'll take them and process them. So you've got to get this green nasty part off. And what I typically do is I'll just stomp on it where I find the nut and get most of it off that way. And then I'll just spread them out on my patio and take water from my rain barrel or just wash the rest off that way. And then I spread the, the nut. So after I get the outer part off, they look like that. And then you just spread them out once again on a newspaper to let the insides dry out so that they shell better, so that when you crack them open, uh, you get the big pieces out. And then uh, I make stuff from them. So that's what I brought tonight, the uh, black walnut honey squares. But uh, I also make this black walnut baklava, too. And they're both really good. Black walnut and honey pair really well together. Uh, OK, so here's a plant called a groundnut. And you have a lot of this in Marblehead. Maybe you didn't know it, but it's if you take the path from the lead mine area going into downtown Marblehead and you get kind of a swampy area there, there's a ton of groundnut just growing right along that pathway. It's a member of the bean family, so like beans, you don't plant beans now because they're very sensitive to the frost. So this plant knows that, so it's waiting until May when the, all the danger frost is passed and that's when the foliage starts coming out. But the edible part are the tubers, sorry, and, oops, sorry, so there they are. That's what's underneath the ground. That's the main edible part in the ground nut. And, um, and those are available year round. And so uh, my favorite way to cook them is just to uh, slice them up thinly and fry them in a little vegetable oil and make ground nut chips. 
All right, and then there's the juice of artichoke. Uh, this is another plant with a very assertive growing habitat. Now this plant, depending upon who you're talking to, it is or is not native to Massachusetts. It was here in 1620, which is the usual cutoff date where we say, if it was here in 1620, then it's native. But, you know, truth be told, it's actually a plant that was native to the Midwest. It's not native to New England. So how is it here in 1620? The reason is our Eastern Indian tribes traded for it because we had quahog shells or other stuff the Midwestern tribes wanted. And we got the Jerusalem artichoke tubers in return. And it is very likely that patches where the Jerusalem artichokes are growing today are descended from the patches that were originally established by the Native Americans in here in New England. All right, so this is the edible part, and this part is still available now because the growing season hasn't really kicked in yet. Uh, but I'm going to guess that like a week or 10 days from now, it'll be too late, and these tubers will begin to sprout, and they're better before that happens. There's a golf ball for scale. They come in a mauve outside or a beige outside. They're edible either way, and you can use them most ways. You use the potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. Okay, so uh, that's... Uh, almost the end of my show. I'm just going to give a couple examples of projects I know out there where people are trying to get some edible natives out into the landscape. So one of them is this growing native project. This is a project down in the Potomac watershed area outside Washington, D.C., where they've enlisted school kids to collect acorns and black walnuts and stuff like that. And then they pass the nuts along to nurseries and they grow them out into trees and then the trees are planted along the rivers, which I think is a great project worthy of emulation. So uh, I hope that this kind of idea catches on. And then uh, there's a park, which I'm embarrassed to say, even though it's been in my slideshow for a long time, I've never been to this park. It's outside of Providence, Rhode Island. So it's between downtown Providence and the airport. So if you find yourself there and you have a little extra time, you can look for this. It's near where the, the greenhouse and the conservatory is at Roger Williams Park. And it's this uh, edible landscape where they've worked in mostly natives into the landscape and edible stuff. And then in Wellesley College near the observatory, they've got an edible ecosystem garden where they've also incorporated some natives. Okay, and I get to finish my show with a local example here in Marblehead. So, some of you may know that this is one of the places where I nibble on the landscape. I've led walks for many years, going back, I think, uh, maybe at least 20 years. Started where the Museum of Science was sponsoring them, and then it became Trustees of Reservations, New England Wildflower Society, Mass Audubon. So, one of those groups has sponsored a foraging walk that I've done where we go through Steer Swamp, and then we walk over at Low Tide to Crown and Shield Island. Well, last year, with my Johnny Appleseed hat on, I noticed there weren't any beach plums on Crown and Shield Island. So once I got back to the mainland, I contacted the trustees and I said, I noticed this. How would you feel if I planted some beach plums? And it took a while to have it percolate through the bureaucracy, but I got back a, yes, please do it. And so I went out to the island and I identified some good places out there for beach plums and I dug the holes. And then I got on the phone and I started calling people like the Marblehead Conservancy to see if anybody would help me with this project. So, uh, so here I am checking out the island and seeing, you know, this is the kind of place where I see beach plums growing in other places. And it's just not here because this is sort of a little isolated habitat. There aren't beach plums right nearby where a bird could, you know, poop out a, a pit and get one established. So, but it looked appropriate. And so the ecologists from the trustees reservation said, well, regardless of the edibility, I'm happy with this because pollinators like the flowers and wildlife like the fruits. So I think it's an enhancement. So he said, yes. So, uh, so there I am digging the holes and uh, Uli Welsh, you probably know her. She's a photographer here in Marblehead. So she was walking her dog on the island. And I said, Uli, would you take a picture of me while I'm doing this? So that's her picture right there. So anyway, uh, so then, uh, a bunch of people in this audience, and you will see their photos just a second, uh, helped me one day in November where we took 14 beach plums that I bought from the New England Wildflower Society, and we carted them across at low tide to the island, and then we planted them. Uh, and, um, and this was in November, and now I have an embarrassing admission to make. I have not checked on them until today. But I thought, there's no way I can go to this talk today. And, uh, and, and not know the answer to how these trees are doing. And so um, low tide was at 11 o'clock, so I rushed up here as soon as I could. And it's kind of a mediocre low tide, so there was not a big window of getting out there or not. So I wore my Wellingtons, and I was able to wade out there, 
check the trees. Of the 14 trees we planted, I found 13 of the 14, and it's possible the 14th one just eluded me. And uh, although one of them looked a little dodgy, the other 12 look fine. So, uh, so they survived the winter, and you know, so hopefully, and uh, I'll have to talk to you know folks that you know help me on this, or maybe there's some of you in, in the audience that uh, might consider helping water some of these trees a little bit. Uh, just as the weather heats up, just to help ensure the fact that they'll be able to survive as they're getting established in their new home. Okay, and this is information I have on the internet. If you want more details about you know, what's native and what's edible, uh, this stuff is there. Okay, and here's my foraging book. Now, this was published by the Essex County Greenbelt Association, a group I hope you all know. And if you don't know, I'm going to tell you that Greenbelt allows foraging as a permitted activity on all their properties that are open to the public. Um, so I am so grateful for that, that I give them all the money this book makes. So the books cost 15 bucks, but I just send it all to them and just said, look, buy more land with it, create more foraging opportunities. So that's my show. Thank you. So, uh, can I ask, answer any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I love collecting sumac. Do you have any rules of thumb of like um, being near a road and like what is too close to a road and what kind of road? Right, right. Those are very logical questions. So, um, I do pay attention about that. I worry about that a little bit, but not a lot because um, uh, if I went to a really busy roadway like 128 or Route 1 or something like that, and I gathered meal after meal after meal of a plant that was growing like just a few feet away from the road. Over time, I could be accumulating some nasty stuff that's in brake linings and other stuff that's just ending up in those plants, okay? But, um, you know, I have a very diverse diet. As much foraging as I do from all over the place, I'm also eating, you know, food from organic farms and farm stands and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not a huge amount of my diet. But, but even so, I do pay attention. You know, when I can, I avoid heavily traveled roadways, places where everybody takes their dog for a walk. Although, if something's growing above a certain height, even the Great Danes can't reach it, and I don't really worry that much about it. So, yeah. So, use your common sense about that. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, um, you know, this, this is something I would do regardless of whether or not it's good for me, because I think being outside is good for me, connecting to nature in this visceral, tangible way is good for me. But it turns out that uh, a lot of this wild stuff actually, you know, the, 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 the hot term I hear to describe them is nutrient dense, is a lot of this stuff. Because a lot of our conventional fruits and vegetables were uh, developed from these wild counterparts. And in order to move it from a wild thing to a conventional thing to make it bigger, usually they made it bigger with water content. And so, like the strawberries, a classic example, those teeny little strawberries are intensely yummy flavored, whereas when you blow them up into the commercial scale, they lose a little bit of the, you know, how yummy they were. So, um, you know, a lot of wild plants are supposed to be higher in vitamins and minerals and all kinds of, you know, the trace elements they're just picking up from their habitat as uh, conventional things. So, the, the best advice I could give you is to get Arthur Haynes's books. And if you just Google Arthur Haynes, you'll track him down. He's written Ancestral Plants Volumes 1 and 2. And he gets into much more detail than I do about the, the nutrient constituencies in plants and also some other pharmacological stuff that's way over my head in terms of, you know, other ways that you can actually, you know, uh, uh, have these thrive on these wild plants in addition to the regular stuff. Okay? Yes? This is a comment. I am so happy to know that there's a use for Japanese knotweed. <laughs> <laughs> we are living in the mecca yeah, yeah, of Japanese yeah, knotweed. Yeah, and yeah. I can right. see the grandchildren eating. Yep. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I mostly pick it to eat it, but I will tell you a story about Japanese knotweed that I, I, when I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell the story. So I'll make this the last thing I talk about, then we can break for more refreshments, and uh, I'll sell some books, and you can ask me more questions if you want. Okay, so 
Maybe some of you that are my age or older remember many years ago the TV show 60 Minutes did this show on the French paradox. And they're trying to figure out how is it that the French aren't all dying of heart attacks with all this fatty food they're eating all the time, the foie gras and the croissants and all this stuff. And so they started studying it and they discovered that maybe it's the red wine that they drink with their meals. And then they started looking at red wine and then they identified this constituent called resveratrol that's in grape skins that they thought might be responsible for it. And then they started studying resveratrol and see what else it could do. And so there's some debate about this, but there's some evidence that resveratrol not only lowers your bad cholesterol, but it also helps cure cancer, helps cure Lyme disease, and helps make you live longer. And so as the news is getting out about resveratrol, the pills are flying off the shelves. There is a $30 million business in resveratrol pills in the United States. And almost all those pills are imported from China, which is totally absurd. We could have, you know, Marblehead Conservancy brand resveratrol pills from the, you know, Japanese knotweed you have here. And you can support all kinds of, kinds of good conservation programs from that. So I believe it, the, the, the highest amount of resveratrol is in the roots. And uh, herbalists I know in New England make a tincture from the roots and they're using that to treat people with Lyme disease. And, and it seems to be working. So, yes. Have you found a use for phragmites? Well, uh, I haven't. I haven't, but I've read a numerous, numerous uh, sources that um, if you take the growing plants from about a foot tall and you dry them and you pulverize them and you sift out the fibers and you take that powder and you moisten it and you put it on a piece of aluminum foil and you heat it, it's supposed to swell up like a marshmallow. I wasn't able to do it, but that's what I hear. All right, so thank you very much and uh, hope you'll try some of this stuff. Thank you.